it. Um, I'm going to introduce the Isaac Walton League. If you're not familiar, um, I wasn't familiar with the league before I started working with them. So I'll just introduce you guys to our mission statement. We were founded in 1922, and our mission statement is to conserve, restore, and promote the sustainable use and enjoyment of our natural resources. And that includes soil, air, woods, waters, and wildlife. So obviously today we're here to talk about waters, uh, specifically groundwater. A lot of you may be familiar with surface water like rivers and lakes. Um, Save Our Streams program that I work with um, works with streams. Uh, but today we've got a couple people here to talk about groundwater. So you may or may not be familiar with groundwater um, as a drinking source and kind of some of the, the rules and, and how things work regarding drinking water in, in this country. Um, so the Safe Drinking Water Act and the Clean Water Act, both uh, they regulate drinking water coming from public systems. So if you're one of those people that answered you get your water from either ground or surface water through a public system, that's usually through a city um, or some type of other provider, then that's regulated under the Safe Drinking Water Act. Um, however, if you get your water from a private well or like Lena's going to talk about a spring, uh, that's not regulated the same way. Um, and oftentimes private wells, at least here in Iowa, um, don't really have much regulation for water quality standards. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about how that affects people and, and what kind of affects water quality underground. And these guys know a lot more about this than I do, so I'm going to stop talking and pass it off um, to Aaron. So. Aaron Schroeder is going to be our first speaker. He's a source water protection specialist with the Iowa, Iowa Rural Water Association. Uh, he's been working there since 2018. Aaron assists public water supplies with developing and implementing strategies to protect their water source. Uh, he attended the University of Northern Iowa and earned a bachelor's degree in earth science and environmental science. So Aaron, I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to you and turn my mic and camera off. I have to make you the presenter, so hang on just a second. Sure. Should be good to go now. Okay. Um, I think I'm sharing the correct screen. Yep, looks good. Awesome. So thanks, Zach. Um, so as, as Zach mentioned, uh, my name is Aaron Schrader. I am the source water protection specialist at the Iowa Rural Water Association. Um, my organization, IRWA, we provide um, technical assistance to water and wastewater utilities in the state of Iowa. Um, specifically, I assist public utilities with um, creating, developing, and implementing source water protection plans to um, just make their make their water supply more resilient. Um, I complete three of these plans per year um, per my requirements. And today I'll be just talking about the program here in Iowa and some of the resources we use to complete a plan. And more specifically, I'll talk about source water protection as it relates to the 2018 Farm Bill. Um, I guess I'll, I'll touch on that kind of vaguely, but I'll work that in here as well. So starting off, um, source water just refers to lake, stream, anywhere that you obtain drinking water. Uh, source water protection is about taking a proactive approach to protecting drinking water from contaminants at the source. And source water protection planning involves developing and implementing strategies uh, just to make your water supply more resilient, like I mentioned. Um, well, with the source water protection planning process, um, there are delineated capture zones for your source water and um, just working to mitigate any potential contaminant sources in those areas. So communities complete uh, source water plans for a lot of reasons. Um, normally it's just something like high contaminant levels or um, a lot of potential contaminant sources, whether they're point source contaminants, something like a, a wastewater outfall or Thing, you know, maybe a leaking underground storage tank to non-point sources, which are much more common here in Iowa, such as runoff from agricultural land. And, you know, you, communities might request a source water protection plan when they have some new development pen, de 
new development pending. Um, maybe there's a gas station getting built in town and a utility wants to see how it's going to affect their, their water supply. Or a lot of the times, um, sanitary survey recommendations when the Iowa DNR does an inspection, um, they'll refer me to a community a lot of times just to uh, work with them and help them with the source water plan. So I've got a just a, a few snips here on that matter. Um, this is a, a nitrate graph for uh, this well to the south here, as you can see um, in that well, there are some fluxes in the nitrates um, getting above five parts per million. The MCL is 10, so they're still not close to that. But uh, as you can see that the red line represents the further south well, and there's like some agricultural land in there. So that kind of prompted this community to, to um, work on a source water plan. And just if you look at the map, there are a few other small point sources in that area. And I'll touch on this a little bit more later. Um, a little bit of background, uh, here in Iowa, there are 1,835 public water supplies, and of those 1,835, um, 1,572 use a direct source of water. So those would be communities that I would be eligible to work with on a source water protection plan. Um, 263 of these uh, just purchase their water, so those would not be ones that I would work with. Um, specifically, there are 832 community water systems and 749 communities. So normally I work with community water systems or most commonly I do. And most of the source water plans that are completed are um, for community water systems. So out of, you know, 832 um, community water systems. There are currently 290 um, completed source water plans in Iowa, which is about 35% of community water systems or 18% of just all, all of those 1,572 public water supplies. And usually between myself, um, some folks with the Iowa DNR and some other organizations, we complete about five to 20 of these plans per year. A little more background just in Iowa here. The plan, the program kind of in its somewhat current state uh, started in 1998. And, um, and it's since then it's been a voluntary program, meaning no, com no community is required to complete a plan, um, but they're certainly encouraged to in a lot of cases. And uh, most communities are pretty good about um, working towards protecting their source water. Uh, there we kind of outlined or they outlined a seven step process in 98 and 99 which is still used today which i'm going to walk you guys through um the state um provides source water assessments the iowa dnr does and they define susceptibility and outline um susceptibility rankings on how to kind of rank contaminants within your capture zone so to jump ahead, I'm just going to walk you guys through the seven steps here for source water planning in Iowa. And I mean, they're fairly intuitive. Um, just organizing a team of vested interested individuals with a vested interest, um, identifying your source water areas, wells and contaminants, assessing and ranking them, um, coming up with some implementation strategies, and submitting and implementing it, your plan. So. The first step, um, just being organizing a source water team, which generally is local individuals with some sort of vested interest in the project, um, usually four to six people. Um, I've seen as few as three, and over 10 in some cases, um, just depends on the community and the level of interest. But usually um, members of one of these source water teams are your treatment operator for the utility landowners, conservation groups, city officials, business owners, and I, I bold the treatment operator um, because I've, I've heard it said that like the the beginning, middle, and end of a good source water plan is a good treatment operator. I think somebody close to the utility that can implement these things. And yeah, so there um, the the source water team's goal is just to guide the development of the plan um, and to offer input and assist in some of the projects. 
the next of those seven steps is just to identify your source water in your case. And most of the time, hey, Aaron. Yo. Sorry to interrupt. Um, your audio seems to be going in and out. We can hear you, um, but it keeps getting really quiet. Then sure. it'll come back. I'll, I'll I don't move know my if it's a little bit closer to me. I don't have an external mic, so maybe that'll help. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know if it's internet connection or hardware. Um, but it, I'll let you know. It might be, yeah, I, I think it might be hardware. Um, okay. Uh, I will, I guess I'll just keep rolling. Um, so the next step is just identifying your source water areas. Uh, these are usually for groundwater systems, um, community, computer modeled with an analytic element model. There are a few of those that still get used, um, visual AEM and, and WAM. They're kind of some older software. Um, but your, your input parameters for modeling these capture zones are just aquifer data, well construction info, and the more info you have, generally the more accurate model you can come up with. Next thing is just inventorying wells and contaminant sources. Uh, again, point source and non-point source. So in, in this case, you can see here we have some Eggland, um, some point sources, a looks like a hazardous material spill, that green dot, um, these triangles represent some underground storage tanks that I guess in this case have since, have since been removed. Um, but yeah, and it, usually most of these uh, contaminant sources are already kind of, I have good data on them, but a lot of times I'll ground truth and, you know, figure out some coordinates of some things and just make sure everything's kind of where it actually is. And then we'll prioritize um, and rank these contaminant sources uh, with a few criteria being used, just the location of the contaminant within the, the two, five and 10 year capture zone. Um, the susceptibility of the aquifer, which is based on confining layer thickness. So anything with fewer than 25 feet of confining would mean that that aquifer is highly susceptible to contaminants at the surface as confining layer thickness increases, susceptibility decreases. So the next step is the most important one, which is developing and implementing an action plan, um, which are usually just management strategies to help with some of the outlined contaminant sources or potential contaminant sources. In Iowa, uh, watershed management is kind of big, just land use best management practices in the watershed or in the capture zone area for the well. Um, education and outreach, I've, I've done some field days, um, not recently, of course, but uh, you know, going back a couple years. Um, removing leaking underground storage tanks, which are becoming less and less of an issue. I, I don't know that any of my plans actually had a, a successful um, leaking underground storage tank removal just because they're, they've been less and less of a, a concern. Um, and then just infrastructure issues, whether it's um, wastewater leaks, um, water leaks, maybe a community's having a quantity issue where they're experiencing a lot of water loss. So um, developing some strategies to mitigate those things. Uh, all, all communities with a source water protection plan are required to have an emergency response. Um, lists contact information for a bunch of um, organizations like the utilities, uh, well, you know, well pump specialist in the newspaper, I mean, and everything in between. So, yeah, and then just finally submitting and implementing your plan to the Iowa DNR. They're reviewed by DNR technical staff and placed online in a uh, on a, on a website called Source Water Tracker, you can go and view all the source water protection plans that are completed in Iowa. And they like to see what's called substantial implementation, just being, um, you know, multiple things or um, implementation strategies from the source water plan being then implemented um, at the time of plan completion or having a um, clearly outlined timetable to complete a lot of these strategies. So to shift gears slightly, um, 
I thought the funding with the 2018 Farm Bill would be of interest to some people, particularly in the Midwest. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how we're using that in Iowa. So the 2018 Farm Bill required 10% of NRCS conservation funding to be used to protect drinking water sources, which is $4 billion over the next 10 years. Um, so since 2019, um, just a bunch of um, folks from a lot of different organizations in Iowa, um, including, you know, landowners, um, anybody, a lot of folks with different interests have been working on um, targeting source water protection implementation and trying to figure out the best way to spend these funds um, to help out as many communities and landowners as possible, um, just to help with water quality as efficiently as we can. So this is our current map of priority areas. Uh, the, we'll focus on the green since those are groundwater priority areas. Um, so the green, the green is um, a 12 sub watersheds. So any uh, any groundwater system that falls within these green areas is in a priority status. So these, this is a map of all of the groundwater systems in Iowa, um, all of the capture zones. So that map I was showing earlier, you can kind of see the red, purple, and green, the two, five, and 10 year capture zones on some of the green maps. Um, green represents there being modeled as karst and some other stuff that I won't get into too much. Um, but yeah, so any of these, uh, any of any groundwater areas that fall within these um, target HUC-12s um, are then given priority status for source water protection funding. And for me, those communities then are priority areas. The ones without a phase two plan are priority areas for me to um, assist with creating, developing, implementing a phase two source water protection plan. So here's an example of, of what that looks like. There's one of those larger HUC-12s with a source water protection area outlined um, within it. And as you can see, the purple represents the priority area, which is just all of the land in land parcels that touch um, the two, five, and 10 year capture zones. So um, these are the conservation practices that are eligible for increased funding um, through the through the farm bill funding. So I've outlined some of the, the major ones, at least here in Iowa. I've got a few examples of cover crops and terraces, but um, these are eligible for source water protection practices, whether it's groundwater or surface water. Surface water. Again, most of the smaller, um, the communities I work with are generally groundwater systems in Iowa, um, but not always. So. These are some good examples I've got from a guy in um, Southern Iowa with Rathbun Regional Water. Um, this is, these are some newly constructed terraces um, in the Rathbun Lake watershed. This photo was taken in 2019. And these are, or this is a farmer planning into, uh, planning into a cover crop in the same watershed um, in Southern Iowa. Also taken in 2019. So, um, moving forward, our goals have just kind of been um, to tweak our recommendations for farm bill funding. Um, and specifically, I'll be working with um, the communities that are recommended, or at least I'll be prioritizing working with those communities um, that I could then um, that, that I could then help spend, you know, the farm bill money, farm bill money efficiently. And other than that, I've just been working on um, outreach and growing the source water protection program here in Iowa, um, doing as many talks and this kind of thing as possible just to get the word out there. So I've got some contact info here and I will stop sharing and turn it back over to Zach, but I will be available for questions here after he presents. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Aaron. I am making Leanne the presenter right now. We can get her going. We had uh, had several questions roll in during Aaron's presentation, so 
thanks for that, folks. Um, we'll try to get to as many as we can at the end without uh, keeping people. Uh, right now, we can see your presentation, Leanne. Is that good? There's your yep, looking good. Okay, so let me make sure. Oh, what did you say? I was going to introduce you real quick. Oh, yeah, go for it. Sorry. <laughs> So uh, this is Leanne Kermitis. Uh, Leanne's an associate professor in biological systems engineering at Virginia Tech. Uh, she holds a PhD in environmental engineering from the Gillings School of Public Health at the University of North Carolina. And she's been working on issues related to safe drinking water and adequate sanitation access in the southern Appalachian coal fields for the past 10 years. Um, so. I think she's planning on talking a little bit about uh, that, access to drinking water in Appalachia. Totally new concept for me, so I'm excited to hear what you have to say. Awesome. Think you're good to go? Yep, so you can just see my screen? Yep. Okay. All right, so welcome. Thank you for spending part of this Friday. I'm going to try to build on what Aaron talked about with the basics of where we get our water, but a very specific case study here in the Southern Appalachians. And you can actually tell what part of the mountains you're from based on how you introduce it. So here in the Southern coal fields, we have the Appalachians. Fun story. So I always like to start my talks by thanking those who make it possible. Uh, these are our many sponsors, the Virginia Tech Frail and Life Sciences Program, our Exposome Center, and the Institute for um, Society, Culture, and the Environment. But most importantly, the students, I have two very intrepid students, Hannah Patton, who was actually for this work named the College of Engineering Student of the Year, and Austin Wozniak, a very active undergrad who won our ACC Meeting of the Minds for undergrads. Okay, so we're gonna start out talking about things that we take for granted. So the Washington Post several years ago, and you can look up this article, they have a great interactive platform, compiled data from the 2000s related from the census related to indoor plumbing. And they determined that nationwide, almost 2 million people in the United States, the most wealthy country in the world, lacked access to complete indoor plumbing. So in this map of the United States, the darker counties are those with higher rates of missing indoor plumbing. And you can see that those are concentrated in the Four Corners region, Alaska and Hawaii, where we have substantial native populations, along the border, so the Colonias in Texas. And I'm going to be talking about this region, kind of where Kentucky, West Virginia, and Virginia come together, the Southern Appalachian coal fields. So I mentioned that that data was from 2000. And I won't get into the, the minutiae here, but the way we collect census data has changed so that it can be hard to get data on infrastructure in the home at that level. But we dug up some public use microarray data for this region, and we found that if you look, so just for some uh, knowledge, I hope everyone can see my pointer, where I am in Blacksburg in Virginia is 30 miles south of the West Virginia border. There are areas here, you see that dark red, where over 10% of homes lack complete indoor plumbing. So why is this? Well, unfortunately, when I think of Appalachia, which is operationally defined by the Appalachian Regional Commission as 420 counties stretching all the way from Mississippi, believe it or not, up into New York, I think about the culture here and the vibrancy and these beautiful mountains, um, but it's also very synonymous with poverty. So the Appalachian Regional Commission was developed in the late 60s in order to provide more economic resources. They keep records of whether counties are attainment zones, and those are in terms of attainment of education and household income and now also uh, rates of opioid substance abuse disorder. And you'll see that this region where Kentucky, West Virginia, and Virginia comes together, we have a lot of distressed counties. So perhaps it's not surprising that there are difficulties with infrastructure. 
So I want you to take a moment, if we were all together in the before times, or I guess we're all flung around the country, so this is kind of exciting, where would you go for water if you didn't have a reliable in-home source? So we've seen over the years things that happened in Flint, Michigan. What happens if you're not so sure that you want to use the water coming out of your tap? Your first thought might be to go for bottled water, and bottled water can be great. Um, it's very expensive. So you probably don't want to use it for a long period of time, and you probably only want to use it for things like drinking. When you think about all the uses of water in your home, washing, cooking, bottled water would get a bit pricey. You might rely on neighbors or family, but that, so you know, your water in your home isn't working, maybe there's a pipe break, you walk over to, you drive to a family member's house and take a shower there and collect some water. But that presupposes that your neighbors and family have access to water and that they're willing to give it to you. So what my group has been looking at and kind of long story for how we discovered them are these public roadside springs. So things like this artesian well, which is being collected in a cistern here um, in Southwest Virginia. And through some other projects, we started to notice people using these and wanted to just kind of start to pick apart why that was. So as a side note, um, not all springs look the same. These are some pictures of different springs that we've collected water from, ranging from North Carolina up into uh, Northern West Virginia and Virginia. And you'll notice that they can be as simple as a pipe coming out of the side of the road, or you can have kind of an old school well with a pump, uh, or very fancy things, like I'm not even sure quite how this works, this long tube contraction that is on this fence. So again, we had just noticed these, pro these springs cropping up as we were doing other kinds of field work throughout the region and wondered if the water was safe to drink. So we collected over 80 samples at 21 different springs in five states between 2016 and 2018. So we just go to the spring, collect the water, drive it back to my lab and analyze it. Not surprisingly, all but one sample was positive for total coliform bacteria. Total coliform are a type of bacteria that naturally exist in soil. So this isn't that surprising because it just means the water's not sterile. You wouldn't think that any environmental source of water would be sterile. But over 80% of springs were positive for E. coli bacteria at least once. E. coli are a type of bacteria, believe it or not, everyone listening to this webinar right now has E. coli in their gut. It's what helps you digest your food but it's supposed to be in your gut, not elsewhere, which means that if we find it in the environment, there is fecal contamination. And as I say, we all grow up knowing you don't wanna drink poop. So E. coli, if you find that in water, if you are reliant on a public water system like those Aaron talked about, that would be an exceedance of one of the Safe Drinking Water Act's maximum contaminant levels. If there was E. coli in your water, there would be a boil order, not a good thing. We also found two springs that exceeded uh, levels for manganese and six that exceeded levels for aluminum. These are related to secondary maximum contaminant levels. Those are related to taste and aesthetics. So that means the water looks funny. It doesn't mean they put you on a boil order because that would actually concentrate the water, but it means the water might not be as palatable. We had two springs that exceeded the recommended standard for sodium, um, but they, when I say they exceeded it, they exceeded it by almost 10 times the level. So there's this guidance level from the EPA related to sodium and water. If any of you or your loved ones or friends are on a low salt diet, you probably think about the food you're eating, but you take it for granted that there's not sodium, you're not drinking salt water. So this was kind of curious and leads to a bit of a side note. Are these really springs? So Aaron talked about, you know, differences between surface and groundwater. If we're, as a hydrologist, if we're talking about a spring, this diagram here, which one of my PhD students put together years ago, a spring is anywhere the natural topography cuts into the groundwater, the aquifer, 
So there's water that is coming out to the surface, okay? Um, for something like an artesian spring, like you might think of from a movie that's bubbling up, that water was under pressure. Now we assume that groundwater is safer than surface water because it is protected from all of us pesky humans and the things that we put on the surface of the land, right? It's protected from fertilizer, from dog waste, everything else. But in the region where I'm talking about, in the Southern Appalachians, we are underlain by karst geology. That means we have these beautiful caves, um, fractured bedrock underlying our soil, but it also means all these caves are almost like shortcuts down to the groundwater. So I love this diagram because it's showing that any industrial or anthropogenic sources on the land can kind of shortcut into the groundwater. So it's not quite as protected as we think. Now, if you go back and remember I was talking about salt, that's another layer to this story. So it turns out that some of these quote unquote springs are likely not groundwater, they're re-emergent surface water. So we have, you can think of a stream that is running along the land, dips down into the groundwater and then re-emerges. And it's not, it was surface water. It also could be, as it turns out, those very salty springs were not groundwater or re-emergent streams at all, they were underground mine pools. So old mines that were mined for coal 50, 100 years ago, they gradually fill in with groundwater and that groundwater spills to the surface and then is actually being used as a source of drinking water by the community. So this is not a waterfall. You can kind of, if you look, see that little pipe at the top, it's actually by a religious sign, which is a whole nother story. The water that's pouring out is spillover from an underground mine and is being used for drinking water. So, do people actually visit these springs? I showed you these pictures that are just pipes coming out of the side of a mountain. I just showed you a waterfall coming out of a mine. When I started doing this work and I said, hey, you know, this water, there are a lot more contaminants than I was expecting and it's not really groundwater. Some of my colleagues said, yeah, but are you sure that those are actually sources of drinking water? Those might just be, you know, outfalls for the mine to relieve the pressure of the underground water. They're just runoff culverts. And yeah, that might be true. So what we did was we started leaving surveys, very simple surveys. We rated them so that they were sixth grade reading level or easier. And we left them self-addressed around some of these, the closer spring sites around Blacksburg. And we ended up having almost three dozen returned. And what we found was that yes, indeed, the majority of the survey respondents were collecting that water directly for drinking. What was more surprising was how many collected water at least once a week. So when you think about how heavy water is, you need a pretty big collection vessel for that water. And you have to drive, these aren't in easy to get locations. They're up in the mountains, they're not in the middle of town. People are actually putting time and effort into collecting water there. At some of the sites, we see evidence of other water activities. For instance, this site, which is actually not that far from Virginia Tech campus, we frequently see soaps and wash, wash rags because people are doing some of their washing here. So why? Why would people collect water at springs? At first, our initial hypothesis as scientists was that these people were falling into that category of um, homes that didn't have another option, right? They didn't have piped in home water. So that was our initial hypothesis. Um, we did have two respondents that said they didn't have in-home water, but they didn't leave any other contact but we found that it was a little bit more nuanced of a story. So people might have water that's piped into their home, but they couldn't afford their water bills, so that water was shut off. Or they were reliant on household springs or wells, and then when the area was developed, they couldn't afford to have the connection to the new municipal system. They were reliant on water systems that they didn't trust or that failed. So they 
wouldn't have clean water coming to their homes or they would have extreme weather and their private well would dry up. Some people said they just didn't trust the water that was coming into their house. So people have water that is, um, you know, they can turn on the tap in their sink, but they don't trust it or they didn't like the taste. The majority of people did say taste was one of their motivations for collecting spring water. We had people who wrote us these long letters, which you can see, I've kind of taken a picture up there. I just asked four questions and I got these long letters. People said, you know, being raised on well and spring water was an honor. They love good old mountain spring water. Chlorine tasting city water was nasty. If you are like me, someone with a background in environmental science and public health, you can be simultaneously charmed and very frustrated by an emergent website called Find a Spring. And this is a place where people actually gather online to crowdsource these locations of springs to go collect water. Um, and I can sometimes be frustrated by some of the science that is being shared there. Other people said, you know, the water is toxic or they weren't getting notified about issues with their local drinking water system. We've seen these high profile water system failures like in Flint, Denmark, South Carolina, in the United States. And we assume that if there's something wrong with our water, and for the majority of, this, of us, this is true, the authorities would let us know. But people in these communities don't really, that trust has been eroded. And if any of you have kept an eye on the news of this region, you'd understand why. Martin County, Kentucky, this was about three years ago. Um, it's a fascinating story where there was a, a mine impoundment that failed and it forced the entire county to go on to city water back 20 years ago but they didn't really in upgrade the infrastructure sufficiently. So about three years ago, they had a problem with their reservoir running too low. So right here, you can see this pump isn't bringing in water. People don't have water coming to their home. And they also had a huge problem with disinfectant byproducts and metals in their water. So in Martin County, Kentucky, which is one place where we have sampled people collecting water from um, these alternative sources, these roadside springs, people have just lost trust in their municipal system. Some of this we believe is due to the failure or the abandonment of small water and wastewater systems. So Aaron talked about how many systems there are in Iowa. Particularly in this region, we have these really tiny little uh, community water systems. Some of them were put in by coal companies to support old coal camps. As those companies failed and moved on, because we're moving away from coal, um, there's no one to take care of those systems. So they fall into disrepair. People can't afford a full-time operator. Now, in addition to those issues, so those are all issues of trust, right? People are, I don't trust the water. It doesn't seem to taste good. I don't like chlorine, et cetera. We also found that people just genuinely value these springs. This is a valued community resource. People talked about coming as children nearly 100 years ago to collect water from the spring. Um, I had this fantastic couple who went and collected information on the historical nature of their spring. This was at a location in Virginia and mailed it to me from the public library. People have been doing this all their lives. This is just kind of what you do. Another little vignette, we, when we collect this spring drinking water, we give all the sample data to the local health departments who say generally, yeah, every now and again, someone calls us. It's not our job to monitor that water, but if you have data, we'll hand it out. Uh, in West Virginia, we gave the Mingo County Health Office some of our spring data, which they passed along, and it resulted in an editorial where people were kind of uh, emotional about the fact that we were suggesting that the water wasn't pure and a great source of health, that they viewed this as a, something that they'd always done. This was a, you know, a resource for the community and there were actually kind of spiritual connections to this water. Uh, this all comes home to me because during, I love this region and I'm always traveling around and actually there's a fantastic in non pandemic times, a fantastic Christmas celebration in Bramwell, West Virginia, which 
fun fact, was the had the highest density of millionaires in the world at the turn of the century because of the coal industry. And while I was there a couple years ago, I picked up this book, A is for Appalachia, got it for my kids. Oh, this will be cute. Plus they can learn about where we live and the work that mom does. And lo and behold, W was for water. And it mentioned that many of the old timers complained about the awful taste of city water and preferred the fresh water from their mountain springs. So at this point in the talk and in my research, you might be tempted to think, wow, all we need here is an education program. People just, they don't like the taste of, you know, piped in water, but that water is regulated by the Safe Drinking Water Act. It's a lot safer. It seems pretty inconvenient to go collect your water. I can't believe they're collecting water from mine pools, right? But my grad students and I started to think about this and whether there was some truth to these beliefs, whether the reason people felt this way was actually underlain by, you know, it was an accurate belief, especially knowing the struggles that some systems have had. So we did follow-up testing at two dozen homes that were linked to six springs in Kentucky, West Virginia, and Virginia. So we recruited households, we would go collect water from the household, um, and I can get in the particulars of that if you'd like, and then the same day we collect water from the spring that they typically used, so that we could compare their in-home water quality to the spring water quality to see which was safer. We also had them fill out a little survey, and this was all voluntary. So not surprisingly, we were seeking people for this study. Our study population were people who drank from a roadside spring, so the majority of them said they didn't trust the water from their tap. Now, this is a big old table full of numbers. Let me walk you through it. The middle in blue, those are the safe drinking water contaminant standards. So you'll notice the first is total coliform and E. coli. Like I talked about earlier, if you find total coliform or E. coli in your water and it's a municipal source, you have to go in a boil, boil order because you're in violation. Some of these other standards are just related to taste and aesthetics. On my left-hand side, which I think is yours too, you have your home water sample and on your right, sample from a spring. If we look at the spring water, there was E. coli bacteria and total coliform. And there was also some high aluminum. So this water should be boiled. There's an infectious disease risk because there's fecal contamination. In the home, there wasn't that fecal contamination, but we saw very high levels of iron, manganese, and aluminum. Aluminum at even higher levels than in the spring, which means that, that again, these are taste and aesthetic, not necessarily health-based, but that the water does not look palatable, right? So it's got a funny color, it doesn't taste right. So even though the spring presents an immediate health risk drinking it, right? If there's fecal contamination, there might be any kind of parasite or infectious bacteria in it, the home water is not palatable. And before you think, well, but you know, so it's got a funny color, Here's what the water looks like. If you look there on the left, see that brown orange water? Even if I told you that was healthier for you, you're probably not gonna really wanna take a big swig of that, right? No one's boiling their, their dinner in that. And this really aligned with exactly what we got from people's survey data. They said the water had an unpleasant taste, it had an unnatural color and an unpleasant odor, right? So it looked milky, it looked muddy, it didn't taste right, that's why people didn't want to use it. So before we go and I answer any questions, I just want to bring up the idea that we think about access to safe drinking water as an issue that is beyond the United States, right? A lot. I, I also teach water and sanitation in developing countries here at Virginia Tech, and we, we talk about, you know, digging wells in Africa or how you manage spring water in arsenic-rich regions in Bangladesh. But I read this paper shortly became a, before I became a professor, and I keep this quote, 
that poverty and water problems are correlated in complex ways that have implications for all nations. So understanding how to solve these really difficult issues of water access in geographically difficult areas and areas with kind of a complex history and culture, learning that here will help us to solve that problem beyond our borders as well. And I will just leave you very briefly with a picture of me sampling point of use drinking water in two different countries. One is the United States and one is not. And um, you can take a moment to guess which one is which. Normally I'd have audience participation, but I'll let you know the one on the right where I'm actually wearing the inappropriate shoes, um, I'm just wearing sandals, that is West Virginia, and the left one I'm in Guatemala. And I will sign off and happy to take any questions. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> um, Aaron, if you're there, could you uh, you could turn on your webcam for questions? That'd be great. Awesome, thanks. Um, thanks, Leanne and Aaron, both for your presentations. That was really cool. That was my first time hearing both of those, so I learned a lot of stuff, and we had some questions coming in from the audience. Um, so I'm gonna rewind and and start with uh, some of the questions that came in for Aaron sure uh, we had somebody ask if um, if making these sort of water protection plans sometimes includes gaining control of the drawdown area to protect the water supply at depth um, so I'm assuming that's asking if people have control of yeah or gain that's control of groundwater. that's that's a complicated one. Um, so any new well that's drilled in Iowa, um, and th this might even be nationwide, I don't know, but in Iowa at least, um, the city has to show, or well, the public water supply, I guess usually a city, um, the PWS has to show that they have control of 200 feet within, you know, a 200 foot radius around the well, which in a lot of cases doesn't cover the entire drawdown area. Um, there are a lot of rules in place in Iowa, um, specifically for who can and can't drill a Jordan well, um, which is where that would be kind of a, a bigger concern, the, the deeper aquifers. Um, but yeah, that's a that's a complex one. I can try and get you a better answer too, but yeah. Um, somebody also asked um, if Iowa allows injection wells for disposal. I don't know if it's in your realm or not. For for disposal? For waste disposal. I don't think so. Um, I know that there are a few ASR wells in Iowa, um, which are, in that case, mostly for storage. But as far as waste disposal, that's also a great question. Um, I know in central Iowa and in west in into western Iowa, um, some of the really deep Jordan wells, because that's that can be over 2,000, 2,500 feet down there. Um, they start there are a few ASR wells down there, just meaning um, just aquifer recharge wells, um, and commonly used for storage. But yeah. All right, I've got uh, one more question for Aaron, then got a couple oh, sure. for. Leanne. Uh, somebody also asked if uh, these protection plans become public information. Um, for example, for the members in the area can inform to the drawdown and protection area so that they can work alongside the planning group. Yeah, um, a lot of times we'll try and um, work with the public as much as possible when we're completing them. Obviously, that's been difficult you know, in the past, whatever, nine months. but. Uh, but yeah, so um, my some of our source water teams will invite the public to meetings. Um, participation isn't usually great if that's the case, but um, yeah. And uh, once the plan's completed too, I mentioned there's a um, 
on the Iowa DNR, there's a website called, or a link called Source Water Tracker, and you can search by public water supply name and you can find links to all kind of info, um, well logs, phase one assessments, sanitary surveys, and then a phase two or source water protection plan if they have one. Nice. Love to hear that. Um, sorry, I just had a pop up on my screen. Um, sure. All right, Leanne, uh, somebody just asked uh, for some clarification about what complete plumbing means. And I tried to unmute myself and hit the webcam, sorry. <laughs> oh, that is actually, I will try to keep my, my uh, answer short. So it depends how the census defines it. Typically, it means that you don't have um, hot water or cold water in your house, right? So you don't have a tap where you can actually turn on and have temperature regulated water or that you don't have a flush toilet. So you need both. Okay. Um, somebody also asked, uh, well, they, they gave their background saying that they remember drinking spring water as a kid in Southwest Pennsylvania and it tasted better than the public water from my house. When the water tastes better, what are we tasting or not tasting? What's the difference? So, yes. So, and I have actually, there is a great group that started looking at roadside springs in Pennsylvania as well. So even though I was a little bit farther south, it's very common up there. Um, and that work is based at Penn State. Um, what you're tasting are the trace salts and minerals and a lot, I don't want to get too much into taste, but if you had, if you ever tasted, which don't, it's not good for you, deionized water, so all the metals, all the salts taken out of it, it would taste terrible to you. What we associate as taste are these kind of trace amounts of minerals. Um, and taste is a really funny thing. What we are used to is what we like. So what we grow up on is what we like. It's kind of like how if you grow up on well water and then you go to a city, you will taste the chlorine and it will not taste good. It will taste like bleach. Whereas someone like me, I'm actually in town in Blacksburg and I grew up on city water. I cannot taste chlorine at all. But if I go drink someone's well water, I'll taste the iron. And it's just, it's a very sensitive thing how we're, but we react to these very tiny levels. Interesting. That actually is a, a good segue into another question. Um, someone asked what the what the rate of E. coli infection is in the spring water drinkers, and if they develop any sort of sort of resistance. And they said oh. it reminds me of when Americans travel to Mexico, we can't drink the local water, but the local residents can. That is an excellent connection and it's exactly the same as what we think. We don't have very good rates of, and again, I won't get into the whole lecture on how we measure gastrointestinal illnesses here in the United States. We don't have a lot of information on rates of illness. It's just something we don't collect well here in the United States, but we have a lot of anecdotal evidence of people who, you know, their kids come in with their grandkids to visit for the, the holidays in non-pandemic times and everyone comes down with a stomach ache and so there is some interesting research that's beginning to happen down in the southern more southern part of the appalachians actually in alabama looking at whether they can find levels of um, antibodies to different pathogens and actually rates of infection of parasites like hookworm amongst people who use environmental sources but I don't have that data in my region. I would love to have it, but not yet. That's cool. Um, someone asked a question for either of you, and this might be our last one because we're coming up on the end of the hour. Um, for either present presenter with respect to private wells that are not unsafe, but that produce water that looks, tastes, or smells bad, are there filtration or treatment systems available for purchase? To improve taste, odor, etc. Do you have anything you recommend, Aaron? 
Um, nothing that I recommend. Um, in Iowa, I know that um, this, you can send any any water into the state lab and have it uh, tested private well. Private well water usually they're pretty good about um, testing if you do it manually. Um, but as far as actual treatment system or anything like that, nothing offhand um, for private wells. Um, and uh, generally, I work with smaller um, municipal systems, so. No, I guess I don't. How about you? <laughs> so I do know, and I figured you would know the details, which you did. Iowa State has an extension program where they can actually provide you some feedback on private well maintenance, similar to yep. what we have. We have a sister or brother program, whichever way you want to make the sibling at Virginia Tech. Um, depending on the amount of contamination or the funny taste you might need a full in-home you might need a water softener or a water filtration unit there's some emerging evidence that those end of the tap screw on just like a brita will mm -hmm. remove some of the chemicals but um, that's actually an ongoing area of research for how long those work that we're looking at and some other folks are looking at for private wells um, so yeah, I would just connect with your well program at Iowa State. Yeah, it's also for those of you in Iowa, I know like our county health departments have, have funding to test your wells. It's all voluntary because they're not regulated under the Safe Drinking Water Act, but um, you can send it into the county, have it tested. Usually through um, the, the, the county's program in Iowa is the through the sanitarian. Okay. So yeah, I knew we had a bunch of people on here from the US, so that might be relevant if they're coming in from Iowa. All right, well, we have uh, we've crossed the 10 o'clock mark here in Iowa and 11 o'clock out east. We had a ton more questions that we weren't able to get to. Um, so I'm really glad people were engaged and uh, Aaron and Lee, they really liked your presentations and it sparked a lot of curiosity. So um, if there are specific questions that you guys want to reply to I'll just send you a copy of the questions and if you are interested in following up um, let me know but uh, if people viewing have any any questions you want to follow up with you can email sos at iwla.org um, whether that's about the presentation itself um, the webinar or information that was provided and I can try and get answers for you so um, thanks everyone for joining us in the audience today and Especially thank you to Aaron and Leanne for taking time to um, join us today and make this presentation. Um, this is really insightful and people obviously enjoyed it. So, yeah. All right. Um, and with that, we can sign off and everyone have a good weekend and happy holidays. All right. Thank you, Aaron and Zach. Thanks, guys.